Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster and we are covering one of my favorite brands of all time, Undercover, which if pronounced correctly is actually pronounced under cover. We're going to be talking about fall winter 2018, which was maybe one of the biggest seasons in Undercover's history. This was just a, a season of monumental change for them as a business. Stylistically, there's all this stuff that we have to talk about and we don't have a lot of time to talk about it. So we're going to divide this up into sections so that we can better analyze what Jun Takahashi is actually trying to do with this menswear show. We're gonna start things off with a little bit of show context so that we can kind of understand the narrative that this show is fitting into. Then we're gonna get into the meat of the actual show itself. So we're gonna start off talking about the way that the clothes themselves relate to the primary inspiration, 2001 A Space Odyssey. We're then gonna talk about the many, many collaborations that are featured in this show, some of which are not terribly obvious. We're gonna talk about the very purposeful music that June selected for the show. As always with these runway show collections, I strongly encourage that you actually go watch the original show because like the music and the clothes and so it all makes this very big, impactful difference if you're really watching the original thing instead of me just having to show you these pictures of it. Additionally, because the show is so heavily inspired by the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, I strongly encourage that you just stop this right here and go find a copy of that movie and watch all two and a half hours of it along with the show, which itself is about 30 minutes long. So, are you back after three hours of watching both of those things? Fantastic. Let's get cracking. Okay, so of all the initial setup questions that we typically ask on this channel about shows, by far the most important question to answer here is, when in the timeline of Undercover is this happening? The most important time. Up until this point, Jun Takahashi had been presenting men's and showing women's. What that means is he does a runway show for the women's wear, but the men's wear just gets a lookbook, basically. Takahashi addresses this in the documentary that he made for his collection, The New Warriors, which is the one that follows up the collection that we're talking about, but it still kind of applies. What he said was, until recently, I really didn't put much emphasis on men's design. That was an area where I felt I lacked a bit of skill. Such a strong flex that someone who makes legendary menswear could say, eh, I wasn't really thinking about it. I always wanted to do a conceptual women's show. For me, the men's collection is what I want to wear, a balanced and objective undercover worldview that has been built up over the years. I couldn't really think of a worldview that works for men in the past, but in the last few years, I could start forming it. Undoubtedly though, cost had to play a huge role in this. Undercover was showing during Paris Fashion Week. Here they've switched to showing at Pitti Uomo. Paris Fashion Week has the absolute highest barrier of entry as far as cost is concerned, and Pitti Uomo, since it's exclusively men's and it's technically considered a trade show, is going to be substantially cheaper to show at. And that's not a diss to undercover. It's just stupid expensive to put on a runway show. In a lot of cases, after everybody gets paid, the brand has ended up spending over a half a million dollars on the show. And this is a welcome change because at least in America, most of the people who are obsessed with undercover are bros. And even cooler, he does a joint show at Pity with none other than Takahiro Miyashita, the soloist. After agreeing to do a show together, the two designers decided that they were going to do a joint theme. That theme was Order Disorder for Undercover, and then Disorder Order for the Soloist. So things falling apart, and then things getting put back together. They apparently did not know anything about what the other was designing prior to two days before the show. So there isn't really one grand narrative for the entire show other than the flood when instead of showing all the same clothes again, they change the boys into one set of outfits for undercover and one set of outfits for the soloist and the boys walked in a big circle together. All right, let's talk about Jun Takahashi's obsession with 2001 A Space Odyssey. Two thousand one A Space Odyssey is a movie that came out in the 60s. Saying that it's the greatest movie of all time is like kind of weird because that's sort of an opinion thing. It is 100% one of the most influential movies of all time. But the long and short of it is that this movie visually still holds up in 2019. It is an insanely good looking movie. 
But you already know that, don't you? Because you just watched it a moment ago when I told you to. There's not a ton of super direct references to the clothing in the film because this film in just about every single way is very sparse. It's a movie that takes its time, doesn't have a lot of characters, doesn't have a lot of dialogue. But for the few clothes that are in the film, June does a really good job of using and interpreting those clothes within his collection. There's really subtle stuff like Look 5 that's pretty heavily influenced by the uniform of the announcement lady for the space travel video that they have to watch before boarding. The bathrobe that one of the astronauts is wearing on the ship is kind of meant to be the inspiration for these really comfy looking Terry suits. The plaid in look three is kind of gently inspired by the photographer during the press conference when he says that we've discovered alien life. The ribbed knit of the shorts in look 15 is kind of meant to be like the leisure wear that they're wearing on the ship. He is running sideways because they are on a spaceship where there is no gravity, but he is wearing gravity boots. Look 37 is an interesting one because it's a really gentle reference to the actual movie itself. Stanley Kubrick had a lot of design work in the film that played with this white on white design that was just executed in some really beautiful ways in the spaceship design. And the same idea can kind of be applied to this really heavy toggle coat like this where you have the hard lines of the pockets and the different panels. If it's all in the same tone of white it sort of has this really haunting beautiful effect to it. Then of course you have the very graphic stuff which Undercover is definitely known for where they just literally pull and paste stuff from the film. The print on Look 33 kind of pays homage to the fact that Stanley Kubrick designed some of the most killer sets for this film, especially when you're inside the spaceship. The way that hallways are handled is some of the most legendary stuff in science fiction film history. We of course have this bad boy, which I think ended up being the premier item of that season and is one of the single coolest stills from the entire movie. Look 17 shows a few different things. There's the outline of the communication satellite that is on the outside of the spaceship that they have to go and fix. This is the way that the computer Hal is tricking them into going outside so that he can murder them. And it also has these six prints on it, which are meant to represent the different screens that Hal has to visually communicate with the crew. Look 18 and all the other stuff that says computer malfunction is meant to replicate the actual moment when Hal cuts the life support from the astronauts that are in deep sleep. A particularly epic, epic reference is these coats that say caution exploding bolts on them, which are meant to replicate the pods that the astronauts go into to repair the ship. It's one of the single coolest designed things in the entire movie, and it is one of the highlights of the collection. And speaking of highlights, there is nothing in the world wrong with pausing a movie saying, that's dope, let's put that on a poncho. Jun Takahashi is a smart guy. A much smaller detail that's pretty fun is these uh, rings and necklaces that are meant to emulate the HAL computer's eye. Additionally, some of the clothes kind of play with this idea of order to disorder by showing clothes that almost kind of seem to be disintegrating. They have a great deal of imperfection about them, especially with the exploding bolts coat. And this plaid one in particular is really interesting because after it came out, we found out that it's made of a wool twill that's built so that it will bunch up and take a really misshapen form on your body. And even in line with that same idea, we see this kind of bathrobe look that features a repeated print of the first astronaut that Hal kills by cutting his life support tube and sends him spinning off into space. In the final scene of the movie, the astronaut, after traveling through a black hole, finds himself in this weird futuristic Baroque style room. And after he emerges from his spaceship, he looks across the room and he sees himself wearing a spacesuit, but he's older. And then he's inside of that body and he looks across the room and he can see an older man in a bathrobe eating food at the table that is also him. And then he becomes that person. And then he looks across the room and he sees again himself as an even older man in the bed dying. 
It's very confusing, but stay with me. This look very succinctly wraps up that final weird, weird moments of the movie. He's got this repeating vision of his partner being thrown into space that's kind of haunting him. And then we have both outfits that he's wearing in his final moments where he's in this bathrobe thing where he's somehow comfortable in this space that he's trapped in now. And then also this all white dressing gown to like sleep and die in. And the rapid aging can kind of be seen on this crisp, runway fresh robe that has been frayed at the edges. And then of course, the tier zero item from this collection, the space suits. We thought it was only going to runway, but they appeared in stores. For a meager $8,000, you too can have the light up, badass spacesuit of your dreams. These are the spacesuits that like inspired a generation of filmmakers and they are so badass and they still look great today and I am very glad that we got one made into a puffer coat. Is that it? There's a lot of references. Yes, confirmed, that is it. Okay, part two, let's talk about it would be a little bit of a waste for us not to talk about the many collaborations that are involved in this show. Beyond the obvious collaboration that he did with the soloist on the show itself, there's a lot of collaborations in there with other companies that you may not notice if you're not super familiar with those brands. There's the collab with Zeptepi on the smaller bags that repeat the same visual motifs and the same materials as some of the bigger coats like the Caution Exploding Bolts coat. There's a nifty little collab with the footwear brand Adieu on the dress shoes. There's a collab with Polartec Fleece on a lot of items that actually end up being some of the more desirable pieces in the collection. There's a collab with a brand called Astorflex on these specific gum-soled shoes. I had never heard of Astorflex before I started researching this show. Nifty little collab with Eastpack on the backpacks. These are probably the collab that got the most press out of this entire collection. Then of course there's the collab with Converse which for Undercover, that's a pretty tried and true bet there. And finally, maybe not a technical collaboration, but all of the pieces that feature this little cartoonish lamb image are from a line of Undercover called The Shepherd. And that's meant to be this line of clothes that Jun Takahashi wants to wear now that he's getting a little bit older and kind of more fully embracing adulthood. It's just elevated basics, basically, that are going to go well with all of the crazier stuff that Undercover makes. When we're trying to read the runway shows of brands that do a lot of collaborations, I think it's important for us to understand what the purpose of those collaborations are within the wider universe of that brand. And in the case of Undercover, I think that most of the time it's him seeing a product by another company that fits very well into the universe that he's created. And so instead of trying to replicate that product on his own, he goes straight to the source and explains what he wants, and then they're able to kind of help him with their product that they've already spent decades perfecting. And undeniably, in the world of streetwear, collaborations are a big money maker. Brands like Converse are looking to brands like Undercover to help them stay as relevant and cool as possible. If you're carried in every mall in the world, it can sometimes be hard to convince your buyers that you are truly about that independent rebellious spirit. So you team up with actual independent rebels to help procure that image. The music in this show was some of the most purposeful and directly tied to the theme of the show that I've ever seen for any runway show that I've looked at really closely. The show opens and the first couple of models start walking out along the very, very long runway as Joy Division's Atmospheres starts to play. Joy Division lyrics can often be pretty cryptic and kind of sparse, but the general conversations around that song seem to point that it's about the lead singer's failing marriage. We only get about a minute and a half into that song before it's switched over into Radioactivity by Kraftwerk. Pretty easy alignment with the theme because it's a protest song about bombs. It's a pretty easy one. Things falling apart, like order to disorder. Then in the fourth section, the spacesuits emerge from the darkness to this song that's from the 2001 soundtrack by uh, Hyorki Lejeshi which is this orchestral theme that is terrifying. It is so scary. It is the scariest piece of music that I have ever heard in my life. If you've never heard this song, I'm gonna link it in the description. Go listen to this terrifying shit. It's very scary. Interestingly, in the soundtrack for 2001 A Space Odyssey, 
that song is put directly next to another song by Lejeshi, which is also called Atmosphere. Coincidence? No. No, it's not a coincidence. Nothing's a coincidence when you're making YouTube videos alone. Go uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter for real, where you will see uh, me in real life with all the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. You get to just see the real me there. It's all me and it's all for you, baby. Um, I love you all very much and I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.